Good morning. Uh, good morning, all of you. Thanks a lot for being here today. Uh, it's absolutely a pleasure to host uh, two of my very dear friends, uh, Jaydeep and Navi. Uh, in fact, I've known these two very interesting people who have done some amazing work in the area of innovation for the last four years. Uh, and I've, uh, I think it's a privilege for me to have them as friends. Uh, I've had done some work with them, uh, at least in terms of events or talking about innovation and doing something with thinkers. Uh, but then uh, just a very quick introduction. Navi is uh, one of the foremost thinkers in the world in the area of innovation. He's listed on Thinkers 50. Uh, hopefully, uh, he is going to be on the big list. I know the results, but I don't want to share it right now. Uh, I cannot. Uh, but then, uh, of course, he has consulted with a lot of firms uh, across the world, uh, which includes like Hitachi, IBM, Microsoft, and so on and so forth. And Jaydeep is a professor at the University of Cambridge. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, if you really look at it, like one of the most famous personalities uh, has a chair there. So he chairs that, uh, uh, or he's a professor there, Jawaharlal Nehru, professor of Indian business. So I think it's a privilege for him as well to really have the chair. Uh, but today it's just been a delight to host this event. So without further ado, I would like to welcome Jaydeep and Navi for their talk, and then we'll go on to the panel. Jaydeep, Navi, please. Thank you. Thanks, Amit. Good morning, everyone. It's a great pleasure to be here with you this morning. Before I begin, I want to thank uh, Amit and the India Council on Competitiveness, Roland Berger, our distinguished panelists, and all of you for making it here uh, so early in the morning on a busy working day. My name is Jadi Prabhu. Um, I'm a professor of marketing at Cambridge Judge Business School. I grew up in India. I studied engineering here as an undergraduate at IIT Delhi. I then went to the US and did a PhD in business at the University of Southern California. I taught in the US and in the Netherlands before moving to the UK. Throughout my career, I've studied innovation. And in the first part of my career, I studied innovation in large Western corporations. And then in about 2000 or so, I turned my attention to emerging markets, particularly India. And along with my co-author Navi, I made many visits to India. And we talked to innovators the length and breadth of the country. We talked to grassroots innovators, entrepreneurs, Indian companies, multinationals, about how they were doing innovation. And we were struck by how different, in a way, they were from their Western counterparts. Something that was particularly interesting was how frugal they were in their approach to innovation. They were very good at taking cost out of the entire innovation process and doing more with less. We thought this was so distinctive and the story so interesting and the lessons so insightful that we decided to write a book on this topic, uh, which was published in 2012. And we called the book Jugard Innovation using the word that many of these entrepreneurs themselves used to describe this frugal, flexible, inclusive approach to innovation. And in the book, we wrote a lot about the people we had talked to. For instance, Mansukh Bhai, uh, who is from a village in Gujarat, comes from a family of potters, uh, has a high school education, but is very innovative. In 2001, when Gujarat suffered a very serious earthquake, he got the idea to make this clay fridge, the Mitti Cool, which uses clay and the cooling properties of water evaporating through the walls of this box to keep fruit and vegetables fresh for up to five days. And he got this idea from reading an article in the newspaper where they, were sh they had shown a matka that had broken after the earthquake and the caption read, poor man's fridge broken. And from that, he got this inspiration. And this, in a sense, exemplified for us this Indian ability to turn constraints and adversity into opportunity. We also talked about other entrepreneurs, such as Devi Shetty, a cardiac surgeon from Bangalore, who, by applying the principles of Fordism, division of labor, specialization, had been able to reduce the cost of heart surgery to something like $1,500 and aimed to reduce it even further to $800, a fraction of what you would pay in the West. He has a thousand bed hospital in Bangalore, the largest of its kind in the world. They perform something like 30 operations a day. 
He has taken this model to other Indian cities and is celebrated for it in the West. He even has a hospital in the Cayman Islands to, de to demonstrate that this can be done even in more developed uh, contexts. We didn't just study India, we also studied other emerging markets such as Kenya, where M-Pesa, mobile payments, has revolutionized the way that people lead their lives, particularly those who are unbanked. Kenya has very large numbers of people who are unbanked, very much like India, but many of those people have mobile phones, even basic mobile phones. So this financial service was introduced into the country, not by a bank, but by a mobile company, Safaricom, which is a subsidiary of Vodafone. And it allows people like this lady and her son to not only speak, but also to send and receive money electronically. They can, for instance, if there is a crisis at home and the mother needs money, he who's working in Nairobi can send it back to her in the village through a text message. And she can cash that e-money in a local corner shop, a Kirana shop, which acts as the agent. This is a very powerful way to do financial inclusion very frugally because you take advantage of what is already there. You don't have to create a new bricks and mortar infrastructure. And this has of course been exported now to many other countries, this model including India. Now in Kenya there's something like 18 million people, many of them, most of them unbanked, who have access to the service. And because they have access to the service now, other people can offer them other services, including solar lighting solutions like this one. Interestingly, this solution was introduced into Kenya by Nick Hughes, who was the person when at Vodafone, he introduced M-Pesa. He left Vodafone and set up M-Copa to offer solar lighting solutions to people who live off the electricity grid. And interestingly, because they can't pay the upfront cost of this equipment, they paid off in installments using M-Pesa. They use micropayments, paying what they can, when they can. And so in a short while, probably in a generation, Kenyans will go from no banking to mobile banking, from using candlelight to using solar light. Speaking of the sun, this kind of frugal innovation is now being applied to go into space. This is NASA's MAVEN, the spacecraft that went to Mars and cost about $800 million. And this is ISRO's Mangalyan, which also went to Mars and cost a tenth of that. And they did it in a third of the time. Again, applying some of these principles of frugal innovation so well known to Indians. Now, since our book was published in 2012, we've noticed there's an interest not only in frugal innovation in emerging markets, but increasingly in frugal innovation in the West, for the West. And there are some interesting drivers of this phenomenon. On the one hand, there is the financial crisis and its aftermath. A lot of people now find their household budgets constrained in a way that, for instance, consumers in emerging markets uh, feel them. Uh, this chart, for instance, shows that there's been a systematic upward shift in the number of people, consumers in Europe, who are value conscious. From a base of about 50% before the crisis, there's been an upward shift of about 10 to 15% in people who seek discounts, people who are comfortable buying private brands, or who have come to accept living with less. So there's a value consumer, value-based consumer. But the consumers in the West are also values conscious. Increasingly, they care about the environment and the social purpose of business. This Nielsen uh, survey found that up to 55% of respondents in, in the West were willing to pay extra for products and services from companies that were committed to positive social and environmental impact. And 67% said that they would prefer to work for socially responsible companies. So there's also an increasingly values conscious consumer in the West. And all this we feel is giving rise to what we call the frugal economy in the West. This frugal economy is founded on a new type of consumer, someone we call a prosumer. 
these prosumers are not just passive recipients of products, they are now active participants in the economic process. And these active prosumers are driving two related movements, the sharing economy and the maker movement. Let's look at each. The sharing economy is, of course, a situation where consumers with spare assets trade these assets directly with others. They may have a spare bedroom, a spare parking place, uh, a spare seat in a car journey. They trade these now through the internet and through intermediaries. And this is growing so fast that the prediction is that by 2025, um, this sharing economy will be as large as the traditional rental economy. The poster child for the sharing economy is Airbnb that allows people to rent out spare bedrooms in their homes. And the CEO of Airbnb, Brian Chesky, uh, has compared his model to the traditional model of hotels like uh, Marriott, who aim to add 30,000 rooms in the entire year of 2014, a number which he says Airbnb will add in two weeks because they don't have to actually create those fixed assets. They already exist. And these numbers can be added literally by the click of uh, your mouse. Now, the maker movement. This is another strand of the frugal economy, where ordinary people, or particularly these prosumers, are now empowered to actually come up with solutions themselves. And these are not just software solutions, but increasingly hardware solutions. They are tinkering using devices that are widely available to come up with products, prototypes, which they might even now commercialize using the web. A large part of this maker movement is driven by access to cheap computing and hardware. What you see here are these uh, are two very well-known such computing devices. This is the Raspberry Pi, a $30 computer that was developed in Cambridge University where I teach. The original intention was to give a computer to every school kid in the UK so that they could tinker with it, they could learn coding, and they could learn hardware. And if they broke it, it would be so cheap that there wouldn't be a problem. This Raspberry Pi has been phenomenally successful not only with the kids, but often with their parents or their dads, who are using this to make other devices. And here on the right is the Italian version of the Raspberry Pi called the Arduino. It's an even smaller, and even cheaper microcontroller, which people in Italy, for instance, uh, and elsewhere in Europe, are using to create other devices. And all this is giving rise to what is increasingly being called the Internet of Things, where Hardware, objects are interconnected, and software can then power them to do things. Navi will give you some examples of those things. And these makers no longer have to just tinker in their homes or garages. They can go to dedicated spaces, uh, such as tech shops, or fab labs, or make spaces, where for a monthly subscription, they have access to a variety of tools, such as 3D printers, or CNC cutters. And they can there, along with others, tinker and create their own prototypes, which they may then decide to commercialize. Here's an example of a product that was developed in a tech shop. This little white object, the square, fits onto the audio jack of a smartphone and can be used to read credit cards and take credit card payments. This idea came to Jack Dorsey, uh, the founder of Twitter, when a friend of his was trying to sell some uh, household equipment from his garage, was unable to do that because he couldn't accept credit card payments. So Jack Dorsey and his friends went to a tech shop and said, can we develop a little device that will help you make credit card payments attached to a smartphone? So this thing was developed in a tech shop. And now it has done something like $30 billion in transactions and is a very highly valued company in a short space of about four years. Here's another uh, product that was developed in a tech shop. This is the Embrace Baby Warmer that was developed by four students at Stanford 
when they took a course on design for extreme affordability. And the challenge of the course was, can you come up with a prototype that's 100th the cost of the existing solution? So they took incubators, which might cost something like $20,000, and came up with something that's less than 100th. It's about $25. Now, this is not an incubator because it doesn't have, for instance, an oxygen tent, but it solves a large part of the problem of infant mortality, which is when babies are born prematurely, they can't maintain their body temperature and so will either die or be severely affected. This little blanket uh, can not only wrap the baby and keep them warm, but also has a phase change waxy pad that can keep temperature constant. They came to India with this. They tested it in, uh, in Karnataka with midwives and mothers in rural India. And now this is being applied uh, in many Indian states in the public health system. They developed the prototype for this in a tech shop. And they have become quite celebrated for this. Uh, here is Jane Chen, the founder, along with uh, Barack Obama. Uh, and indeed, now the White House and the US government have become champions of this maker movement. So much so that Barack Obama hosted a maker fair, a meeting of makers in the White House recently, and went on record as saying that today's do-it-yourself is tomorrow's made in America. Uh, I myself have attended a maker fair uh, uh, last year in Rome, which was the European edition. Uh, and I was amazed to see so many ordinary people, often with their kids, demonstrating products that they had developed in their homes or in tech shops that used, for instance, the Arduino chip to come up with lighting solutions in the home, solutions for farmers, and so on and so forth. So this is a very real revolution happening in the West, this frugal economy. Um, and I now ask Navi to tell us about some of the entrepreneurs who are rising to this challenge, taking advantage of these, uh, these developments to disrupt whole industries. Good morning, everyone. Uh, great pleasure to uh, follow, uh, follow up with what Jadeep was talking about. And uh, soon you will see what this thing is. This is my Jedi knife. So uh, indeed, I want to talk about how entrepreneurs now are leveraging the frugal economy to disrupt traditional sectors. And this is the most exciting part because this is the golden age of what I call hardware startups. In the old times, we used to talk about software startups. Uh, think about India known for software prowess. But now what's happening is that there are a new generation of entrepreneurs who are connecting the world of bits to the world of atoms, the physical world. So let me give you a couple of entrepreneurs who are doing exactly that. Uh, the first one is a spin-off of Berkeley University. It's called Cellscope. They have invented this uh, optical attachment. You attach to your smartphone, and it converts it into an otoscope. So a mother can insert that into the ears of a daughter to see if there's an infection. And you just replace this attachment with another attachment, and it turns the smartphone into a dermoscope to check your skin conditions. What is amazing is that this attachment cost a fraction of the entry-level medical device used by doctors. That's why it's disruptive. Because this is called the consumerization of the healthcare sector. That means that the kind of devices and tools that used to be only available for the experts, like doctors, are being given to you as consumers and citizens, so you can use them to take care of your own health in a preventive way. And of course, it's also affordable because it's frugal, because not only is cheaper, that's not the real point, it saves you time. And time is the scarcest resource. And therefore, we'll talk about later when we say about doing more with less, the less applies not to money, but to time. Second example, this is my neighbor uh, in Silicon Valley, who invented this company called G-Drive. Uh, they make these uh, things called G-Sticks. These are actually wireless sensors designed like a plastic ruler that a farmer can stick in different parts of the field and it starts collecting detailed information on soil conditions. It has sensors here, uh, soil conditions, uh, air temperature, sunlight level, etc., and help farmers reduce use of water, electricity, energy, and labor, while also increasing um, productivity in terms of yield, but also crop quality. 
So it allows them to do better with less. Why this is important? Because California is the fifth largest exporter of food products, but soon will be facing a devastating drought situation. You might have seen that in the recent news. And the first political wars in the US, as they call it, within the US may not come because of uh, oil, petrol, which is now we have plenty because of shale gas, but it's going to come from water. So here's an interesting solution. I see how it would be relevant not only from a Western country like America, but also from emerging market like India. Another solution is uh, Carnot Computing. This is a French engineer who came up with this uh, ingenious idea to create ra uh, digital radiators. So as, as you can imagine, in cold countries, you need to heat your home and buildings and apartments. Uh, and uh, what he did is essentially he collects the heat generated by the microprocessors to actually heat houses and offices for free. Okay? This is a very sustainable alternative to the so-called data centers, which today consume 2% of the global consumption of electricity. Out of the 2%, 1%, which is 50% of the energy, is used to cool off the servers which overheat. This is an aberration, because engineers think that heat is a waste we need to get rid of. This engineer thinks otherwise. He thinks actually waste can be reused. That's what he does with the digital radiators. So this is a fantastic frugal solution for two communities of people at the same time. Scientists or people like us can submit a request for computation that is then processed in a distributed platform using the digital radiators that are all connected. At the same time, it generates heat freely for people who are you know, underprivileged. Okay? So it's a dual benefit at the same time. Another example is Comte Nickel. This is a startup in France that uh, allows uh, you know, the people who are underprivileged to walk into a mom and pop store, a Kirana store, and then within five minutes, they can activate the service that gives them two products. One is an international banking ID, so they can send receive money. And the second thing is give them a prepaid debit card, international debit card. And the annual uh, management fee is only 20 euros, which is extremely frugal by European standard. Today, they have signed up 100,000 customers already within a couple of months, of which 75% customers are middle class French. So it shows again that a frugal product is not for the bottom of the pyramid, can also apply for the middle of the pyramid, who actually is feeling the squeeze, okay, economic squeeze. Uh, now the real interesting question is, how can large companies can also start leveraging this frugal economy where it's becoming easier now to innovate faster, better, cheaper? Well, we looked at that, and uh, this is what we found, which is a problem. <laughs> Let's see if it works. There we go. So we found something interesting is that on the left-hand side, you see this frugal economy that Jadeep introduced, right, with the cost of innovation going down thanks to these you know, electronic components, the fab labs, et cetera. But see what happens. When I walk into a large company on the right-hand side, that's what it looks like. You still have these you know, functions like R&D, manufacturing, sales, and marketing. So you can see the disconnect between the way the frugal economy operates in a very fluid, distributed way, and the more hierarchical kind of a structure that large companies have, you see on the right-hand side. So the disconnect we note, noted is you know, something which is troublesome. So we wrote a book, actually, to help these leaders in companies at every level Monday morning, what can they start doing to actually integrate their activities into the frugal economy and leverage it? So that was essentially the genesis of the new book we are publishing this week. So for that, we came up with a very simple kind of uh, framework, which is the need for large companies to go from doing more for more, which is come up with more and more sophisticated products using more and more resources to learn to do more with less or actually better with less. So let me kind of spend a few seconds to kind of elaborate this theoretical foundation. What we mean by doing more with less or better with less is actually simultaneously try to create more value while minimizing resources, which sounds a contradiction, but it can be done. It gets even more interesting and challenging when you think about value for whom. Value for shareholders, we know that as businessmen or businesswomen, but the real thing is more value for customers that's important. So are you customer centered? And then also for society at large. And similarly, when we talk about resources, it's not just financial resources, we know that, but also natural resources, especially water, for example. And then time, as I said, time is a scarcest resource. 
So when you minimize time in the drug development industry, and I'm sure that Mr. Shahani will talk about from Novartis perspective, every month you save in drug development can save patients' lives. So time is a valuable resource worth saving as well. So this is essentially the framework, doing better with less, is about simultaneously maximizing value while trying to minimize scarce resources. So with that in, in our mind, this is the kind of book that uh, we are publishing now, which essentially shows to companies how they can operationalize this idea of frugal innovation. For that, we came up with the six principles uh, that uh, form the six chapters of the book. And I will not bore you with the details of these uh, six principles. That is also a way for you to buy the book and learn about it. Uh, but these six principles actually apply to every function of the company. So how R&D, you know, HR, marketing, and uh, every function of the company can embrace the principles of innovation. But instead of boring you with the details of the six principles, we thought maybe for the because of the scarcity of time, we will kind of summarize them in a framework. So we think that frugal innovation is, of course, coming up with the frugal products and services. That's what customers buy. But there is something more fundamental as well about frugal innovation. It's also about how do you change your entire business model to do more with less? And then more importantly, how do you change the mental models of your employees and your managers to think and act frugally in a systematic manner? So what I will do now is give you quickly a couple of examples of companies, large companies, who are actually adopting frugal innovation to simultaneously come up with the frugal products and services, of course, but also begin to fundamentally change the business models and the mental models around frugality. So the first example, and we are very proud to have uh, the MD of uh, the Indian unit, is uh, Renault-Nissan, an alliance between uh, French car maker Renault and the Nissan. Uh, they actually introduced in 2005 uh, what was at that time the West, uh, one of the least expensive car, the Logan, which then has been uh, sold under uh, an entire new uh, product line called the Dacia, which has actually become very, very successful for the company. Uh, some experts estimate that uh, today it accounts for more than 40% of the company's revenues, so it has become the cash cow for the company. Uh, this was the first chapter uh, they wrote in the frugal innovation journey. Uh, and Renault Nissan, I believe, is actually a pioneer of frugal innovation in the Western context. And now um, you will actually hear from Sumit Chowney, the MD of Renault uh, India, who is here with us, how they are writing the next chapter in this uh, journey, which is even more exciting because it's being written out of India, which is essentially to come up with another generation of cars that combine ultra affordability with ultra quality. Uh, and this is going to be, again, a very exciting journey for, uh, for us to watch because up to now, 10 years after introducing the Logan car, to my knowledge, there is no single Western car maker that has managed to pull off this feat of creating a car that is both affordable and high quality. Um, second example uh, is uh, this time coming from not frugal products but frugal business models, which is frugal is actually, this is important, we talk about make in India, so we want to kind of uh, share with you this uh, this will be right action op-ed coming up soon in Indian newspaper. Think about make in India, right? Uh, think about what does it mean to come up with good quality products. We think that a frugal product needs to have four attributes. It needs to have affordability. It needs to have quality. Everybody talks about affordable quality. No problem. That's important. But guess what? That's table stake. Every company is going to do that in the next five years. Then the question is what else you can do to differentiate yourself? We think the two other attributes are going to be simplicity, simplicity, is it easy to use, easy to access? And the fourth attribute, the most important one, is sustainability. So sustainability is going to become a core kind of uh, company differentiation for companies to differentiate their offering from the rivals. And one big area that is emerging in the Western world, it's called the circle economy, which is a very way of saying that it is possible now to move from the linear way of uh, making and selling and consuming products where you extract raw materials from mines and earth, you develop a product, you consume for a particular number of years like a cell phone, and then when you're tired of it, you just get rid of it. It goes and you know, ends its life in a landfill somewhere in Africa or somewhere else. So this is a very wasteful model and also very energy intensive. The new model is called circular economy where you actually design a product from the get-go in a way, it uses recycled materials, renewable materials, and then at the end of the life cycle, you can disassemble it and take the components inside to then create new products. So then you have, a, in a closed-loop fashion, a way to reuse materials again and again, which is much less you know, wasteful. This sounded kind of science fiction a couple of years ago when Dame Ellen McCarter in the United Kingdom came up with this concept that she's a global she's a navigator uh, who began to appreciate the scarcity of natural resources when she was sailing alone 
in the ASEAN. And uh, today there are over 100 large companies in the world, including Renault, uh, who have now signed this founding charter to become what we call circular enterprises. Let me introduce to one of them, which is Target. Uh, Target makes uh, most of the world's uh, carpets, like this one, or uh, office flooring systems. Uh, and today they are planning to become a circular enterprise by 2020. What it means is that 75% of the raw materials they will be consuming will come from renewable sources. In the end of the life cycle, they will collect every product they sell and then recycle it. Uh, that means nothing lands in a, uh, in a landfill. Okay? What is really amazing is that not only they can collect and recycle their own products, they even set up a system in the in, in US where they recycle other companies' products as well. Okay? So one company's waste becomes another company's gold. Okay? That's the mindset of circular economy. Even waste is worth gold. Um, now, the next company we want to talk about, and we have Mr. Shahani from uh, the MD of Novartis here with us to enlighten us on this uh, example. Um, this is the idea that, you know, we talk about the frugal economy, right? It's the notion of frugal economy is that supply meets demand faster, better, cheaper. That's why we call it frugal economy. Now, you can say that's fine if you are you know, making a cell phone which has 50 components, or maybe even a car that may have you know, 15,000 components, but what about drugs? I mean, you can make that on a dime, you know, turn it on a dime, you know, uh, make it in a very frugal way. Well, it can be done, uh, and Novartis is actually showing it. Uh, this is a partnership with MIT that is coming to fruition after 10 years. It's called continuous manufacturing. It's a revolutionary new manufacturing technique because it can take place in a micro factory that is no bigger than a container. And uh, this micro factory can produce drugs up to 10 times faster with 50 times less COPEX, CAPEX, and OPEX. And more importantly, can reduce carbon emissions up to 90%. So you can make drugs faster, better, cheaper. And they're going to go live uh, in terms of large implementation starting 2017. So even the drug industry, we can now apply frugality to gain you know, in agility. Um, and then another example we will talk about as well, uh, and uh, I think Gitu is here probably. Uh, Gitu Verma, there she is. Hello, hi. Uh, we are just, we're excited to have Gitu Verma from uh, uh, Industrial Unilever as well, uh, because we wanted to showcase that ultimately being frugal is not about having just a frugal business model, but cultivating a frugal mental model. And uh, the best example of that is uh, Unilever, uh, whose CEO Paul Pullman uh, declared in 2010 the intention to double the company's revenues from 40 billion euros to 80 billion euros by 2020, but at the same time reducing the environmental footprint by about uh, 50%, which is doing much better with much less. Uh, and this involves, of course, changing fundamentally the mindset of every employee in the company to think in a more frugal way. Uh, and that's why one of the key corporate officers uh, in the company involved in this transformation is Doug Bailey, who is the chief human resource officer of uh, Unilever. Why they are doing it, and this is very important again, if you adopt a frugal business model and start changing your mental model and the culture of the company, you become a magnet for future talent. As Jadeep said earlier, two-thirds of the young people want to work for companies that are socially and environmentally responsible. So the reason they are doing it at Unilever is not only to serve the next 2 billion consumers they are going after for the next 10 years, but also to attract and retain talent that they will come work for Unilever and not for a rival like Procter & Gamble. So think about that as well. How do you use frugality to attract talent as well? So to conclude, I would say that uh, what does it all mean? Um, well, we published our first book, Jugad Innovation, three years ago based on five years of research, is to show that India is the birth center of frugal innovation. So the first chapter in this innovation, uh, food innovation journey was written by Indian companies and Indian entrepreneurs, and we are very proud as Indians to say that, and we capture that in the first book, Jugad Innovation. But uh, unfortunately, the West is not resting. Um, now we see the second chapter being written by the Western uh, world, uh, which is actually using new technologies and new processes to do better with less. So now the question is, and the panel will discuss, is can India now seize the advantage of being the you know, pioneer of innovation to go one step further and write the next chapter? But here is a little nuance. Uh, we think that this next chapter shouldn't be about, you know, in a dualistic way, us versus them. It's about actually how India can leverage the best of what India can do with the best of what the West can do and co-create actually frugal solutions 
that can bring more value for less for the entire humanity. So that is what we wanted to kind of conclude on in terms of the context setting. Uh, you can find more information on uh, frugal innovation in a website we have set up called frugalinnovationhub.com where you have a lot of amazing case studies and best practices. Uh, but at this stage, we are going to uh, have James Crabtree take a stage and uh, moderate an excellent panel with some of the pioneers of frugal innovation uh, that we profile in the book. Thanks so much. Thank you, Naveen. Now we'll quickly get into the panel. Uh, so may I actually invite uh, the panelists here, uh, Mr. Ranjit Sahani. Uh, please, if you could join us on the stage, uh, Dr. Wilfred Olber. Uh, Wilfred is one of the closest friends I have. In fact, he also chairs the India Council on Competitiveness. Uh, in fact, uh, has been a big supporter. This event wouldn't have been possible without him. Uh, then we have uh, Raja. Raja is a National Film Award maker. Uh, Sumit Sahani, please. Sumit, if you could join us. Uh, Geetu. And James. 